What? Oh, not yet. Not it's ready. Too late. I, I, I yeah, we got to talk about these accusations against Marcus Philly being on steroids. What's going on with that? <laughs> Let's talk about it, dude. I, mean, I searched I, your I, 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 I searched I'm, your name last night. We've known each other for a long time. I've seen a lot of your content, so you know, I just see all this stuff pop up about about the juice, and I'm like. <laughs> This is amazing. I'm like another guy who's like, you know, being accused of taking some shit. What? Any He's idea? He's really lean. Like, I know, I know, I know. Lean. And if you and if you if you're on the rings and you're on the ring dips or something, yeah. it looks wild. But I mean, if you got a good photographer and that takes the right yeah, picture, yeah. it makes you look a little bit more. So when unnatural. did you start anabolic steroids? <laughs> <laughs> See, if I go back all the way to yeah, it's twelve. Uh, yeah, I was like 13, 13, I got out of the house finally. I'm actually, it's a. Uh, Probably until I got into CrossFit, I was so naive to steroids. Like I played co collegiate soccer at Berkeley, so I was in like in and around like you know uh, NCAA, you know football players, people that I, I suppose there was some performance enhancing drugs that were around. I mean, I was. This in is what everybody says. <laughs> I, I don't even know. Yet. <laughs> I don't even I mean, know what a steroid looks like. I mean, you should so... see my brother. He's in pretty good shape too. <laughs> No, my brothers are not not in the best shape, but uh, yeah, it's just it's funny because I I I really even through all my CrossFit career, I was like, you know, no people, I don't know anybody, none of my teammates or people I know are doing it, and then eventually start people getting popped, and I'm like, oh, this stuff is actually out here. Mm. Wow, I didn't I didn't even know that. And then I think back to when I was like in high school, going to the gym, Gold's Gym in Marin, and I'm like. Oh yeah, the guy that I was really admiring that like had the, you know, abnormally like de developed chest and like up by his neck. I was like, how do I get my upper chest to look like that? He might like, have been doing some he stuff. He might have been doing some stuff. Yeah, but I didn't know any of that. And then uh and then today, you know, I I get the accusations and I'm like, you know, I'm 180 pounds. Like I'm not like a I'm not a really big, you know, I stand next to you guys and I'm like, damn, I'm 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 kind of small. Um I just don't I don't get the concept, you know. <laughs> I am lean. I'm very lean. Um, relative to most people and even inside my sport and people are like you can't be that lean and eat as much as you eat because i talk about how many calories i eat a day mm. and i'm like uh yeah you can if you just do it consistently and you move a lot you just got to move you can't just eat a bunch of food and sit i think around. people uh there's some of the pictures i saw was just like transformation stuff but they're taking pictures yeah. from you like several years ago yeah and i'm like well the intensity of your workouts mm. get more and of course you're gonna i mean of course it's gonna be improvement <laughs> sure yeah i have a transformation picture from like when i was 20 to 33 and it's like 13 years and i'm like i'm jacked i'm like yeah, yeah. i just worked out really hard for you know right. a decade mm -hmm. and that, that happens what do your calories look like right now it's like 3800 to 4000 calories a day mm. and 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 if i so i i do track my macros a bit and i'll eat 3700 calories like on average and then I need one or two like refeed days on top of that a week where I'll probably But you're not over. a normal person. You move around a lot. I do move yeah. a lot. I right? Do, and yeah. you've always been that way probably. Yeah, right? and I, if, if I eat more, then I want to move more. Like I'm just, I can't, I, I don't feel good overeating. That It always makes me like, I, I'm like, I got to burn this off. Mm. I got to get moving. So, but I've also talked about it recently where I'm like, it's a, it's a daily thought where I'm like, I got to move because life wants to make you sedentary. Everything about our modern day life is going to get you stuck to the chair, stuck to the, mm. the the commute to whatever, and make you reach for things that are not the optimal food choices. So, you know, you got to make the intentional choice each day to move. And I'm thinking about it like, how am I going to get some cardio in today? How am I going to train? There we go. Look at the one on the right. That's when I was 17 years old. I Dude, mean, we're going to get you on yeah, more. Of course. We're going to get you on more plates, more dates. Yeah, oh, but, yeah, maybe yeah. you're not. Actually, Greg, Greg, uh, <laughs> yeah, Greg Coach, Coach Greg gave me a little shout out recently, and he was like, "This guy knows what he's talking about." He didn't, he didn't talk to Natty or not with me, but he, uh, he at least gave me a nod for having good principles of staying lean for the long, the mm. long haul. Yeah, yeah, when when you said that you were like under, I'll just say under ten percent body fat. I'm sure that's where tons of accusations came from. Yeah, right? yeah, I had a, I had a, a my one of my first YouTube videos that went sort of viral. Um, and the title was 5% body fat, 3,800 calories a day, how, or something like that. You know, it's total, it's you know, Nate put it together. It was, it was great. It got yeah, a lot Nate. of views. Yeah. <laughs> we're almost, we're almost up to 700,000 views on that. But Sick. that was where a lot of people chimed in. were like, no way this guy's coach Greg, check this guy out. Like, <laughs> and then he, sh he jumped in. He was like, yeah, this is legit. And I was like, who's coach Greg? <laughs> you know? <Yeah>, right. <laughs> and, then, and then it kind of went from there. And so, um. Yeah, that was. That is it was fair to say that your calories might be like a thousand calories more than like 
somebody else that's training just because you have been you it just seems like you've been an active person you mentioned soccer and yeah. uh, and since i've known you you've been doing like crossfit and all sure. kinds of stuff so the number might be skewed just because you like to move around a lot it's like programmed in your head somewhere yeah i mean i think a few things i think that you're you know our metabolism is this pliable thing it's like mm. you know if you if you move and you if you move more consistently for a period of time it will it will build up mm -hmm. you know if you obviously maintain more muscle mass it it elevates and then it stays elevated if you eat consistent quality foods that you have to digest that you have to chew that are real that aren't processed uh that can also in my experience elevate you know your metabolism in a sustained way so it's like you put all those pieces together which is what i kind of talked about in that video that got a lot of exposure it's like if you do these things you do it consistently your metabolism can elevate and you can eat more and sustain and stay lean and so yeah i mean i don't i'm not like you should be on four thousand calories a day that's how you're going to get jacked it's like well or ripped you know it's it's not it's not true for everybody but over time it will build up to that and i think when i'm in my past, before I got like committed to a career in fitness, I've had my low points where I was like not moving, you know, not committed to training and exercise, eating poorly, and you know, everything just slows way down. And 2,000 calories could make me gain body fat versus now where it's like I could eat 4,000 calories and you know, I'm, I'm, it's gonna be hard for me to get up to 184. 185 pounds. And let's look at the smaller minute details because yeah, we know that you do CrossFit type workouts, but I mean, during your day, do you sit much? Do you take quite a few walks? Like what does that look like? Yeah. I mean, I, the, the nature of my work now is that I do sit a lot. I, I'm at a desk, um, programming, you know, doing online, uh, writing, writing at my computer. Um, so I'm very much connected to the, to the desk. And so I have to be intentional about that. So I've, I wake up each day at this point and I do 30 minutes of like, you know, relatively uh, high, like moderate to higher intensity cardio or did aerobic I, work. Am I tripping or did I see you on a treadmill with like a laptop or something at one point? Yeah, I did. Like outside your house or something, right? Yeah, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a, like a bike, like a Concept2 bike erg, and then my buddy built these these desks that just sit right on top of it. So this is the desk that he's talking about being glued to there, by the way. <laughs> no. Yeah. So I try and get in movement that way. I'll, tr you know, during the pandemic, like my, my daughters were home, they weren't in daycare. And so we were going on walks every day. And I, that was a great way for us to connect. So finding ways to do that. Um, you know, wintertime is always like the hardest for me because it's like the weather gets bad. You're not, it's, it's cold, not wanting to be outside. So mm -hmm. finding ways that I can build in like, consistent cardiovascular exercise on top of doing the resistance training that I do, you know, five days a week in the gym. How have uh, electrolytes kind of played into things for you over the last several years? Like, has that been a thing that maybe you wish you knew about when you were doing CrossFit or did you even stumble upon any of that when you were doing some CrossFit stuff? Because we've noticed a huge difference uh, in our own performance, especially because like I, I tend to do like lower carb. He's kind of lower carb. Mm -hmm. We don't have the carbohydrates to really, uh, you know, hold, help us hold more water. And so yeah. the electrolytes seem to be really helpful. Yeah. Well, my story with electrolytes is, uh, you know, I think back when I was doing CrossFit, you know, it was like a thought, um, but I was eating really high carbohydrate back then, probably like 600 grams of carbs a day or more mm. just to sustain that type of training and the recovery mm -hmm. necessary. Then fast forward to now, it's like, I don't need, like, I don't feel as good on that kind of you know, carbohydrate load, because I'm not training that intensely. I'm moving a lot, but it's not the intensity that I used to have. So last year, pandemic starts, I'm like, you know, moving a lot, moderate to low carb. I started playing around with carb cycling and just actually really driving my carbs down, 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 and hey, having one refeed day here and there. And I was cramping like crazy. Like mm -hmm. I was, I got pretty, I got even leaner then. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd have these like calf just raging cramps at night you know and like it was it was bad and um you know they like somebody from like element sent me a, a free pa pack and i took and i had it like after like a week i was like my cramps were pretty much gone my hydration was way better i was like oh this is great and so then of course i just i was like give me all the the element packs and i started just you know five a day i was having because i was i was perspiring so much i was having going through so much water and um so it's been you know, consistent, like everyday thing for me ever since mm -hmm. then, for sure. And I'm actually really curious about this too. Did you, cause you said you lowered your carbohydrates, obviously you're doing less work. You got leaner. How do you feel as far as like 
cravings and your body composition now, do you still eat moderate to low carb currently and higher fat? Yeah, my, right now I'm I'm like moderate to to low carb. I probably most days it's like 200 grams of carbs or less, mm -hmm. and that comes from almost entirely from fruits and veggies. So okay. I I don't have like big starches, you know. Um, and the, the only time I feel my cravings kick in is when I'm undernourished from a caloric perspective. Mm. And that's not like, oh, I, had, I didn't have enough carbs. That's why I'm, you know, it's like if I am just under, you know, under caloried for the day, then I'm like, I need something. And my brain tells I feel, me. I feel that. I feel like, uh, you almost feel like a little weak. Yeah. Like you feel like someone stole something from you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a little, little <laughs> chunk of your soul, almost like trying to go without coffee. <laughs> well, I, for me, it shows up as like, I can't focus. Like I sit down, it's like two o'clock. This happened yesterday. Like I sat down at around one thirty or two, and I was I had a block of time where I was going to really crank and get some work done, and I was just like, I can't do this right now. Like I'm I'm needing some food. Like and I was like, go to the kitchen, get some food. Like okay, now I'm going to focus. And I'm like, no, fuck, I'm so hungry. I got to go. You know, like and that's when I'm. I don't keep really bad stuff around the house, but like at that point, I'm ready to eat anything that's in sight. It could be a you know a juicy steak, or it could be a bread with you know butter on it like i i don't i just need calories mm -hmm. yeah. no it's uh it, it, it's crazy how the body can tell but real quick andrew mm -hmm. you want to let people know how they can get to know yeah you guys just heard marcus Lilly talking about element and how amazing it is um if you guys haven't tried it you can get a free element recharge pack right now by heading over to drink lmnt dot com slash power project and you'll all you have to do is pay five bucks for the shipping and you'll get an eight sample pack or if you're just ready to dive all in get the value bundle because you're gonna get four boxes for the price of three no code needed links to them down in the description as well as the podcast show notes again drink lmnt.com slash power project i like that we're talking about calories and carbs and all this stuff and one of the things i've learned from watching some of your videos is that you really do a great job of simplifying things um i don't really hear you talking too sciencey um, you just kind of break things down in a simple, very digestible way for a lot of people. Um, what do you think, what do you think people need to know when it comes to carbohydrates versus fat versus protein? Like, what do you think people, like, what do you recommend to people normally when somebody's just trying to lose some body fat? Do you think they should try to eliminate a macronutrient or should it be more part of their life or does it depend? Where do you usually start with people? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, uh, the fact that you notice I try and keep it as simple as I can, like that's, I think that goes back to, I had a really like big academic history in, in the science, health, wellness. I was, you know, molecular cell biology, went to medical school, was really like deep into academia and fell out of love with it because I was like, I don't feel like I'm making any change. I feel like I'm just mm -hmm. studying a bunch of book stuff and that's not what you actually end up telling people. Mm -hmm. So I have, I've kind of, veered away from that in my coaching career because of an experience I had when I was in my 20s where it just felt like I was disconnected to what mm -hmm. matters. So now, yeah, I just want to like, what are real practical things you can do? Let's talk about that. Let's not talk about how carbohydrates are broken down in the small intestine and what kind of, you know, hormonal signals, like people don't necessarily really need to hear that. They need to hear, well, what do I do? And I... I'm really big on like, if I'm going to focus on a macronutrient with somebody, it's always protein first. It's, you know, I would say the average person who's looking to lose weight or be healthier just hasn't really ever eaten even a moderately high protein diet. Like they don't, they don't even, they, they're just low protein and they don't know that by consuming more protein from good sources, that they could have more energy, that they can feel way more satiated. And they'll have some mental focus and clarity. They won't have, you know, big energy, mental acuity spikes and dips. And so that's that's the place I would start. And then I'm not really a fan of like cutting out a macronutrient for people because when they look at a plate of food, it, they have a sense of like, well, this look, this is what is normal. And when you remove a macronutrient, plates of food stop looking normal. They don't look like the standard diet, you know. Uh, they start looking weird, <laughs> and they're like, oh, "How do you make a how do you make a plate of food with no carbs? Like that doesn't make sense." I'm like, "Yeah, let's just not go there at first. That's mm -hmm. more of like a advanced nutrition concept. We I don't like, need to start there." I like what you're talking about right here because even just to get someone to have some form of a, a plate of food, <laughs> like an actual entree, like an actual dinner, like an yeah. actual. Uh, and Sima says meals at meals, you know, rather than like uh, snacks. Yeah. And I, and I think that that's, 
really great for people. And I think that that's something that people should focus in on more is like, if you can just have three or four meals a day, <laughs> right. you'll probably be doing great. Like yeah, a, a protein source, <laughs> maybe a starch. If you want the carbohydrate, sounds fine to me. That's fine. Maybe, maybe a vegetable. You got the three things there. And it's not, that sounds like a meal to me. Yeah. I mean, what, what cracks me up is like, someone's like, so is, is having five or six meals a day? Should I have seven meals a day? I'm oh, like, God. Yeah. When was the last time you just had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they were well rounded? You know, like let's just go back to the basics. So basics, yeah, again, are just like slap a piece of protein on your plate and then build a meal around it. And the way we build a meal isn't about like get your macros. It's like just put real food on the plate. And what's real? You know, if people eat real food, uh, whole foods, then that's that are not processed. It's going to be hard for them to get a huge whack of carbs. They're going to end up with something that's like moderate to slow digesting. They're going to have vegetables, a piece of fruit. Like no one's getting obese from eating a bunch of bananas. Like that's not happening. They're getting, you know, obese from or overweight from eating, from drinking, you know, big gulps, right? So it's like, okay, a real plate of food is, yeah, have your potato. That's fine. Cook it though. Cook it yourself. Don't buy like fr French fries from the, from the fast food. And then you want a piece, you want some protein, you want a steak. Okay, co fine. Cook a steak. That's fine too. And then throw some, you know, throw some vegetables. So throw something that's like produce in the produce section on there and you're good to go. And if people did that every three meals a day, man, that will fix everything. Whether they have rice on their plate or they don't, it doesn't matter. It's not like, it's not about removing a whole carbohydrate or a whole macronutrient. It's just about real food with protein as the center of it. And I think you're going to feel and look way different in a positive way. And what's your suggestion to people who are like, you know, you tell them just eat meals, which conceptually is very simple and it's easy to do, but then they're like, <clears throat> I'm really having cravings for this, for that, or let's say that they're having a problem fighting off hunger for some reason. Yeah. You know what I mean? So how do you help people with that? Well, this goes back to what I was, we were saying about cravings mm -hmm. that I was having. Mm -hmm. It's like, this, this is a matter of under eating. And unfortunately, diet culture has everybody, you know, for the most part, believing that less is more. If I just under eat, then I'll lose the weight. And of course, like to lose weight, there's a th thermodynamic principle where it's like you have to burn more than you consume. And so we need to arrive at that at some point. But if people approach it with like uh, less is more, less is more, then they're constantly trying to under eat. You need to arrive at it, but you don't need to start there. Because exactly. if they just switch the choices of foods, they will eat less anyway. Yes. And that was why I think paleo was so powerful mm. for people early on was like, don't worry about the amount, just eat the right types of food and just eat whatever makes you feel full. And that worked for a lot of people. Of course, it didn't work for everybody um, because then people started to hack the system. They're like, oh, well, if I just do this, then that's paleo. It's like, yeah, but you're now not eating real food. You're eating a jar of, you know, peanut butter or almond butter. <laughs> paleo like, cupcake. Yeah, I'm like that's, <laughs> there's nothing paleo about that. So uh, I, for people that are struggling with hunger or struggling with people that like with craving, it's like eat more. Eat more, eat bigger plates, eat bigger meals. You know, have the biggest meal of your day be breakfast. I know, you know, we'll get into maybe talking about fasting, intermittent fasting, and what that looks like for some people. But again, that, that, I don't, that doesn't have to be the place to start. Start mm -hmm. your day with enough food that you're like, I'm not thinking about food until like the afternoon because I got all the right stuff in early. And I know that for me, if, if I under eat in the morning, when, you know, I'm tired in the afternoon. I've done a lot of working out. I've done a lot of thinking and kid, you know, kid wrangling. And, you know, it's six o'clock and fuck, I didn't eat enough earlier. Yeah, I want to eat everything on my kid's plate. And I want to go have that, you know, those four slices of bread that they didn't touch it earlier. And like, I want to have all that because I just, I messed up early on in the day and I didn't eat enough. Mm. It'll catch up to you eventually, whether you are underfed or if you're uh, like underslept. Yes. Uh, and then underfeeding is kind of a weird uh, principle because I think that maybe people don't really have a, the concept down, but you hit the nail on the head by saying you like to start with protein. Yeah. I think most people are walking around underfed all the time because they don't have the, really the protein requirement. Yeah. Uh, that they, your body kind of, and your body kind of needs it every day. We don't really store protein. Yeah. And so when you're not hitting those requirements, it's, it's very easy to become hungry. Every time that you, every time that you pass through some of those foods, you start to digest them, you're going to be very hungry yeah. and you're going to be craving. Uh, there's so many delicious foods out there. You're going to be craving those things. Those are the things that you're used to. And so I think that, you know, over time, people just need to kind of understand you need to, you need sleep, 
you need rest, you need good amounts of nutrition every day. And protein is going to be a key factor at just trying to keep that hunger at at bay, just trying to like calm that son of a bitch down a little totally, bit. Totally, yeah. And, and, and I like what you're saying by starting the day with a big meal. And then if you eat more, then you're you're going to have energy and you're going to want to move more. If you eat less, your body's going to recognize like, oh, I'm I'm in I'm kind of starving. I'm in starvation mode. Let's lower your your drive to do things because we want to conserve. And so people start to move less, and then they eat less. They move less, and it then happens even with animals. Yeah, they'll want to move around less. The, you the, know, the less the less scarce, the more scarce the food is, the less they move. Yeah, around. yeah. It's famine time. Don't don't go out and run. <laughs> don't go for two thousand twenty thousand steps today. <laughs> like you didn't eat anything. Just mm -hmm. sit on the couch. The thing that um, I think people are missing now, like I hear this a lot, is like I'm I'm gaining body fat because I'm under I'm under eating. And this is like, here's how the, and I, I want to break this concept down because it's, you know, for people that are in the fitness industry, you're like, that's absurd. Like you don't, you know, you don't like gain mass by under fueling. Like it doesn't work with physics, but when people under eat over time, they start to lower their activity level. And then biology starts to win. Biology is like, Hey, you're hungry, go eat something. And then the net is that they go and binge, they go eat, overeat, and they're under eating five days a week, but two days a week, they're, they're way overeating. Plus, they're not moving because they're not very energetic. And the net result is they are in a caloric surplus and they gain fat. And they think, man, I'm, my metabolism must be messed up because I starve myself every day and I'm gaining weight. It's like, no, you starve yourself 90% of days and those other 10%, you massively overeat, plus you're not moving. Mm -hmm. So this concept of eating more can result in you losing body fat is like what it means for somebody who under eats by 500 calories a day. It means eat about 400 calories more, 500 calories more, just get to maintenance. You'll reduce cravings. You'll not have those binge days. You might have a cheap meal, but you won't have a cheap weekend. And you'll actually have the energy to go for a walk or lift some weights. And after a month, two months, three months of doing that, your body looks better. And you're mm -hmm. like, whoa, I ate more and I look better. It's like, because it's not about what you happen today. It's about what happens over the course of the next year, two years, three years. And if you eat a little bit more, you're going to set yourself up for fewer mistakes or fewer uh, roadblocks and obstacles or falling off the wagon of the longevity game in nutrition movement, you know, training. He just said that way better than us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We've been saying that for a long time, but not like that. I like you did a better job. It was beautifully put. <laughs> Damn, but, bro. <laughs> you know, a big thing is like just making sure and trying to set up intentional movement during your day. Because a lot of people, you know, if you work at a desk job, get a desk riser um, or stand at your desk. Like neither, both of us, we barely ever sit. Mm -hmm. Because like I found that in the times that I did sit years ago, when I'd have to get up to go work out later on in my day, I wouldn't feel like my hips wouldn't feel good. Everything yeah. would feel kind of, I'd have to warm up a lot. But when I start setting up intentional movement, I'm going to get this amount of steps. I'm going to make sure that I'm not sitting at my desk. Yeah. Everything is easier. Even when I'm at a caloric deficit, I'm still used to moving. Yeah. And when you get used to movement, yeah. it makes a big difference. Even when you're in a deficit, you, biology doesn't necessarily have a, have a hand there most of the time. I couldn't agree more. And I make, you know, I set up when I, when I used to work one-to-one -one with clients and how I look at my own day is set myself up for the most, like the highest probability of success of movement. For somebody that means moving first thing when they wake up. Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, is morning cardio the best? Is it fasted cardio the best? I'm like, no, it's best whenever you're gonna do it. I know for me, if I wake up and I can get some cardio in right away, that's a win. Cause I don't wanna do cardio at two in the afternoon. I just, my body's not in that kind of mood. And weight training, it's like, yeah, like as soon as I drop my kids at, you know, daycare, preschool, it's nine o'clock. I come home. I'm probably in a good place to do some work right now, but I got to get my weight training in. Just give me an hour. Let me go crank that. And then I check that box. I'm going to eat better the rest of the day. And now I can focus on work and not be like stressed about like, how am I going to get my movement in? So that's, I, you got to figure out how, what works best for you to be intentional about moving every day. And that there, uh, we're doing, um, you know, for our members of our program, we're doing a cardio challenge right now, 30 minutes a day for 30 days every day. And it could look like, you know, in the gym on the row or on the bike doing intervals. It could look like going for a walk, but just do 30 minutes a day. 
and I've been, I'd started it, um, 97 days ago. So I've been, I'm 97 days in for myself and I haven't missed a day yet. And I do it at 6 a.m. You know, I, I wake up, sauna, cold plunge, cardio. That was this. And, and I, I was like, hey, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to make it crazy hard. I'm not going to go, you know, try and set a PR. I'm not rowing 2K time trial intervals. I'm just going to move for 30 minutes and I'm going to set up a couple different, you know, variations to keep it interesting. But get that intentional movement to start the day. And it's really made, you know, a big impact. And I kind of thought, okay, those days of me doing double sessions, like where I get cardio and then weight train later are over because I got kids now, I'm busy. I'm like, you know what? I can I can carve out 30 minutes to do this on top of what my normal routine looks like. And I'm encouraging a lot of people to join in on that and just, hey, feel what that's like to, to create that. And if I miss my weight training session in the afternoon or later in the day, no biggie. Like I moved for 30 minutes. I got good quality movement in to start my day. And that I think is, is super powerful. I think it's the key word there is a uh, routine. You know, you, yep. it's now part of your lifestyle and hopefully other people can invest in working towards that. It's not easy in the beginning. It's very difficult in the beginning to even just get yourself to a gym at all, or to get yourself to do a workout can be difficult. But over time, you'll find yourself, you're walking, next thing you know, you're in gym training, next thing you know, you're doing hot, uh, you're, you're in the sauna, you're doing the cold plunges, and your whole day is kind of centered around these habits. Yeah. They become as common as uh, just your regular daily hygiene that, you, that we all practice. Exactly, yeah. And it, it just starts with, you know, pick your, pick your one thing that's going to work for you, that's, that's going to be your commitment to your health and fitness every day. And then only add the second piece once that becomes so routine and habitual. And you, you know, any, anybody that's like, Hey, add these 20 things to your mm -hmm. life today. And we're going to be, you know, we're going to be good. It's mm -hmm. like, well, that's too many, too many things. How do we keep it super simple? When did you, before we did the workout today with you, you mentioned that like nowadays you're working out and you like to feel good afterwards. You, yep. you were mentioning that to me now you've come from a CrossFit background where you guys are doing some you just just satanic type of workouts yeah. and you're dead afterwards. Um, but when did you get to the place where you're like, I'm going to work out and afterwards I can still go do the other things I need to do. I don't need to lie down for an hour. Yeah. Well, that was sort of why I depart my departure from CrossFit as a, as an athlete. That's why it happened was that my life had sort of, it started to get a little bit more adult. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay, now I've, now I've got this career, uh, business you know i'm just got married we are, we bought a house we got a baby on the way okay i i know what it takes to to be the best you know for myself at the sport i know how it feels afterwards my life in my 20 from 23 to 28 29 was well suited for that i could just go smash my face against a brick wall and you know call it burpees whatever you want to call it and then just sort of stumble into coaching a group class. I'm like, okay, guys, go grab the thing, you know, whatever. Grab PVC pipe. You know, like over there, like vomiting. <laughs> I, I, was, I was a good group class coach, but there were definitely days where I kind of phoned it in because I was so smashed mm. for my training. Um, but yeah, when I was 30 and I just wrapped up my sixth CrossFit Games and staring at like, what's it going to take to do this again with a job? I mean, with the business, with the 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 new house with the baby coming. I'm like, yeah, I just, I just don't, I can't do it. I can't do it really well and do these other things that are starting to mean a lot to me. Plus it, it and it wasn't like I sat down rationally. I was like, Hmm, is this going to, how's this going to work? It was more like, ah, uh, I'm scared to do that anymore. It, like that hurts too and much. And there's young people coming through. That don't give a fuck. Oh, they, yeah. <laughs> they don't just care about business. No, no, they no, don't no, care no, no, about no. their girlfriend. They don't give a shit about anything. They just want to be the best. And you watch them and you hear them and you're like, oh, I don't sound like that anymore. No. I don't talk that way. I don't do those. Fuck, yeah. man. I don't do those little things anymore. Yeah. I, I better, I better, <laughs> I better get my ass out of the way. <laughs> well, that, that was a big part of it. I was just seeing the, the caliber of athlete coming through who had no strings attached, like living on mom's couch, don't have a single bill to pay, don't give a shit, and they are maniacs. They train all day. And I'm like, that's not me, and they're getting better quickly. And I'm like, I'm right now I'm considered quite good, and I had a good good run. You're like, keep that 400-pound clean, bro. Just keep going. <laughs> yeah, just, I'm out of here. I'm, yeah, I see the 18-year-olds that are like, 
outlifting my my all time PRs, and I'm like, yeah, I got out at a good time. <laughs> Ooh, really? <laughs> oh my gosh, it's it's oh, insane. Of the like, CrossFit Kids movement, the, the yeah. teenagers and stuff coming through were just. I mean, they're yeah, still we used, are. They're we crushing used, it. Yeah, they have just this insane capacity to like they were so resilient at those ages and or few of them are you know and uh, uh, crossfit as a sport has long been put everybody in raise the intensity of training more training more lifting more everything the most resilient survive Sounds everyone else Russian. gets get everyone yeah, else like gets injured <laughs> it's, 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 it's it is that and those you know genetic freaks or the the, the few that actually survive are doing things that we have never seen before from human performance standpoint, all mixed together. And you saw twenty year old snatch three hundred pounds, you know, and be able to run a five minute mile like in the same like, and they're not even they're like nineteen. I'm like, okay, this is a different world, you know. It's a different world, and it's it's that's why I so love the sport. I think it's amazing for what we see come out of it. It's inspiring. We were talking about this. These are inspiring individuals. Wow, that's amazing, but. I shouldn't be doing that. I should do this variation of those methodologies and those principles, which is kind of what functional bodybuilding is for me. Is like, you you want to do those things? We can we can show you how to do it in a way that's not going to blow your lid off, make you not be able to focus on your kids or focus at your work or you know. And then when people are doing too much intensity, then they get into the the whole carb craving, sugar craving, and it blows their diet out of the water because they they push too hard and then they like left the gym and they're like i just did the hardest workout of my life i'm gonna go have five donuts i, I need to have those right now that's what's gonna make me feel better mm -hmm. and I, I like that a lot because a lot of people that are listening some do compete um but a lot like they got other things that are just so much more important but they want to reach like the, a high level of looking good yeah right they want to like they want to be kind of lean etc and they think that they have to kill themselves in the gym to do that when frankly they don't they can leave every training session getting a good one in not spending an hour and a half in the gym yep. um go and do everything else you need to do but the workouts don't need to kill you and that's why like you look the way you do but your workouts aren't thrashing you every day and that's super impressive yeah. And I also think on top of that, yeah, people want to like, they want to look, a, they want to look a bit better. But I think once you get a taste of like training, you also, you see the weight go up a little bit on the bar. You're like, oh, that's kind of fun. I like being stronger, you know? So how can we present training in the context of like, you don't need to kill yourself because here, instead of we have three things that we're trying to get uh, stronger at, no, no, we have a hundred things we're going to try and get better at. This was what really drew me to CrossFit early on was because I always was in search of being better. Oh, give me a hundred things to get better at? Well, I got to diversify my attention. I can spend some time over here. I can spend some time over here. I can, And that, I think, is much better for the longevity piece because someone's like, you know, uh, this week I'm going to work on my kettlebell swings and this week I'm going to work on this. And they're not pushing that maximum every week of the same exact thing to try and eke out one more pound. They're pushing, they're pushing, they, they don't have, they can push it more in the moderate to hard effort ab across a broad spectrum of things. And, and that, again, will keep them going for a long time. That's one of the major appeals of CrossFit is that it's not, you know, powerlifting is so like singularly focused. And if somebody is uh, of the mind of, yeah, that's kind of cool to get stronger on a squat, but I don't want to gain weight mm -hmm. or I don't want to look fat or I don't want to... It, as soon as they start to say those follow-up things, it's like, well, you might not be committed to the whole program because that's sure. part, yeah. part of powerlifting is to try to move the most amount of weight possible. And sometimes it may require for you to go up a weight class. Um, it, it might require you to uh, go through all kinds of things in your training, like because your main focus is bench, squat, deadlift. Yep. You could tear a muscle. You can get hurt because you're brushing up against what your body's capable of totally. in those particular things. And yes... You could, you know, train smarter and figure out ways around some of those things. But in general, you're going to get fucked up. <laughs> you're going to you're going to get, uh, you know, inj injured in some fashion. And you saw that with CrossFit, too, when people started to get so focused on the times and they started yeah. to kind of race against the clock. I think we all can agree CrossFit's amazing. They're like people being able to climb a rope and be able to yeah. do heavy deadlift and mm. be able to do. Uh, There's a lot of West Side Barbell stuff incorporated into CrossFit. I mean. I think we can all agree like a lot of amazing things about it yeah but Craig. it's like with with any 
anything where you're trying to push something to world class or any sport where it's competitive, you know, you to get more points, you got to do more things. You got to do it harder. You got to do it faster. You got to do it heavy, like everything. And, and that's fine for sports, but for an approach to fitness and longevity and health and wellness and looking good, you know, when the, when the, when the times or the weights become such the focus, people lose perspective on like, is this even making me like a happier person? Is this making me a, a healthier person? Is this making me look better? It's like, you know, Hey, like a post on my, I got a faster time on my workout. It's like, okay, cool. But like, are you, are you happy? Or like, are you, do you look the way you want to look? Are you energetic? Do you have good sex drive? Like, do you have all the things that you showed up at the gym in the first place for? Mm -hmm. What did you came? Uh, hey, I'm here to lose some weight. I want to have better energy. Two years later, dude, did you see my time? Like, I got my, my weights went up. I'm like, oh, cool. But you're tired. You don't have good sex drive and you, you still look the same. Like, why is that okay? Like you got distracted by the, the, the metrics and not about how this makes you actually feel and look and perform in life. Mm. Do you think CrossFit for the most part has fixed the resilience aspect of things? Uh, because like, you know, the, the idea when we were looking at CrossFit years ago and there's always memes of how like CrossFitters when they're training, their form's kind of messed up because of the time aspect of things and they're trying to do things fast. Right. Um, but do you think in general, like that's been kind of, modified and changed and you don't see as many injuries or is that still a big problem within that sport? Um, well, I like to be really careful to differentiate between CrossFit as a sport and then CrossFit as the, like a methodology mm -hmm. for, for general population. And I also like to be careful to say like, look, I'm not, I'm not affiliated with the brand or the company anymore. You know, I used to own a CrossFit gym. I don't anymore. Mm -hmm. I used to compete in the sport of CrossFit. I don't compete anymore. Um, I still know many people. I still follow the sport and I still connect with coaches that are in the industry of or in the under the brand of CrossFit. Um, and of course I saw some of the I was an early adopter and I was a, a very proud participant in the early years of the culture of CrossFit despite the shortcomings and despite the mistakes that we made. You know, people getting injured, people getting too much intensity, maybe trying to fast track something that you know, shouldn't be fast track, right? Mm -hmm. You shouldn't fast track somebody to snatch, maybe, you know? With that said, in in an effort to be kind of in, on that leading edge of that community, learned a tremendous amount. A lot of things that gave a ton of value to people. When it was done well, it was beautiful. When it was done poorly, and poorly just means somebody who didn't have experience coaching it, mm -hmm. then it was, it could have, it was disastrous in some cases, or it was really bad for some people. So the, the limiting factor was experience. We're almost 15 years, I don't know, 15 years from like when the first CrossFit affiliates opened up. Mm. So 2007 was the first CrossFit Games. You know, we're 2022 is right around the corner. So we're 15 years later. It's been a lot of coaching, a lot of hours, lot, um, over a decade of the sport, more than a, two, almost two decades of the methodology and when the website was launched. Lots of education, lots of subject matter experts coming in and helping the CrossFit community, coaches, athletes, learn better movement mechanics, learn better things, made a lot of mistakes, seen all the problems with trying to do this. You look at a tradition, like a standard CrossFit gym now, what the programming looks like, it's highly elevated. There's a lot of CrossFit gyms that use things that I put out, functional bodybuilding, as, as their group fitness delivery because it's, it's the same movements. We got mm -hmm. burpees. But we got dumbbell floor presses too. You know, we got we got chin ups and we're also doing, you know, sumo sumo deadlifts at tempo. And so I think a lot of things have just continued to L every, you know, every you, you keep messing people up, that's not a good business move, right? People want to stay in business, people want to help people. And over time it's just continued to get better and it will continue to get better. And and the ownership of CrossFit has changed hands recently. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's, they're still driven to make a profit. They're still driven to drive the sport, to do all the things that help grow a business. But I think at the, at the underlying principle is like, we got to help people. And if the more people we help, the more the business grows, because when people were getting hurt, that didn't help the business. It, 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 it drove people out of the gym. Hmm. So I think there's a lot of things that are getting better. I think that 
there's fewer and fewer people that are just like, hey, you know, I got a good idea. Let's open up a gym and let's just, you know, throw people through a crazy workout of burpees and kettlebell swings and jumping on boxes and cracking their shins open. Like it's happening much less because those facilities and those coaches just, they can't survive in the current fitness climate. They just don't. Like people are like, oh, I see through that. There's too many options out there. Now you got CrossFit, you got uh, F50, is it, what's it called? F45, mm -hmm. you know, you've got these different Barry's boot camps. You've got all these options for people to do functional training with some intensity. And everybody's like, we, we got to keep people safe and having fun and making progress. So it, it just helps everybody r r raise their, their abilities and the quality of what's out there. It's not perfect by any means, but it's getting better. Why, uh, <clears throat> why bodybuilding, like functional bodybuilding, like, uh, I think the term bodybuilding, you know, it's just been around for a long time. And now there's like, obviously there's the sport of bodybuilding, but in your context, I don't think you're really referring to the sport of bodybuilding. Right. I think you're talking about utilizing some movements that will help build the body. Yeah. Uh, but that are movements that can be, uh, maybe, uh, beneficial to your day-to-day -day type thing. Sure. Yeah. Well, this is where the the blending of functional and bodybuilding come together and what you just said at the end. But breaking them apart, you know, I, I from when I was 13 and going to the gym, like I started going to Gold's Gym and I was just doing bodybuilding routines. And when I talk about bodybuilding, it was like the goal was to use resistance to alter your muscle mass, your, to, to grow why, muscle. Why did you do that? Were you just trying to get, you were like scrawny, you were skinny, you were like, I just need to be no, bigger. I was, I was stronger for soccer. It was, it was interesting. Cause at the time I just liked, I just liked moving. I mm. liked doing, like I was with my brother, at like 10 years old. And like, you know, we had a little thing in the garage and it was like, Oh, can I do a pull up on this? I was like trying to figure out ways to do this stuff. I don't know where I got that from, but I just, I kind of liked doing the push ups and, I think I wanted to get muscle, not because I was scrawny. I was like an athletic guy, but I just thought it would look cool to have muscles. So I wanted to go to the gym and my brother wanted to go to the gym and I wanted to hang out with him. And that was cool. So he got his license, you know, at 16, I was 14 and we were driving to Gold's Gym and that was perfect. We just followed the machines description. There's the picture. Okay. This is a chest. Okay. We'll do chest. I'll do all the chests, right? <laughs> bodybuilding to me or those routines were all about what can I do to, to affect the, the size, the shape, the look. And it was never about function. Like you get a little stronger, which is a functional trait, but I wasn't trying to like move well. Like it, I didn't think about technique. I didn't think about technique until I maybe had my first shoulder pain doing bench press. I'm like, am I doing this right? You know, I was just doing following the machine. Like that's the technique. Um, so bodybuilding for years was just about muscle contraction to change something aesthetically about myself. Mm. Um, there's a lot of strength elements involved in that, but it was, that was what it meant to me. But I put 10 years of that in and I showed up to my first CrossFit workout and guess what? I was pretty good at it. You know, I could, I could do the thrusters and the kipping pull-ups and I almost got a muscle up on my first day and not because I had done CrossFit and functional training, because I had done the reps. I had built a base of muscle mass. And I always, you know, I did a lot of machine stuff, but I also got kind of introduced to Charles Polican as a strength coach and a bodybuilding coach early on. And some of his methods and his programs were like strict chin-ups, split squats, you know, heels elevated front squats, you know, movements that were like big ranges of motion. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing bodybuilding with big range of motion. So I have that in my background. And then of course the big CrossFit era, which was very functional. It was very performance based. And at the end of it all, I'm like, Hey, there's this happy medium between the two move to move better and to move like with more power and move to develop muscles and to focus on how to control our bodies and to change our aesthetic. And I think people like this and people who like this think that this looks somewhat appealing how do i make that bridge that gap and then people in the functional fitness world the crossfit world were like i kind of want to keep doing curls <laughs> it's like yes you can and so how do we bring those together and that was where this this mindset around functional bodybuilding just made sense to me it was like i they both have value and they don't belong in different parts of the gym they belong in the same part of the gym i want people to like really pay attention to kind of what what you mentioned there because there's a theme that 
like has happened with a lot of episodes on this podcast when we've had people on. Andre Milanovic came on and his advice to lifters was the first few years, two to three years of your lifting, build up volume. Okay, mm -hmm. so do a lot of high rep work in the gym, build muscle, build your training volume, doing bodybuilding type movements. Yep. When you look at a lot of the top power lifters in the game, a lot of them started with bodybuilding when they were yep. younger. And then once they transferred into body power lifting, boom, for some reason they got strong fast. Yeah. You had a base of bodybuilding. You move yeah. into CrossFit, your body's resilient. You're able to perform really well and adapt quickly. Yeah. There's something, there's a lot there in building resilience in your body with bodybuilding before yep. you start getting into a lot of these other sports. Right. Well, the, and some of these other sports, and when you start to perform in them, they're going to put a tremendous amount of load on, you know, connective tissues. And if you've done the bodybuilding work and you put in those thousands of reps in the volume, you know, it takes time for your, you know, ligaments and tendons to build strength. You can build a lot of muscle mass quickly, but mm -hmm. they're not going to catch up for five, 10 years. So you put in that, that volume of training. Now you're your ligaments and tendons are ready to handle the force production required for an Olympic lift in CrossFit when you're breathing heavy and you've just done toes to bar. So that's part of it. Yeah. One of my, my early mentors, James Fitzgerald, who I know you guys have had up here, you know, he said, uh, it, I remember he said like, well, what's the best, somebody asked him like, what's the best way to, you know, be good at CrossFit? Cause he was the first champion ever. And he's like, yeah, yeah. Do bodybuilding for 10 years. And people were like, no, that's wrong. It's like, no, no, it's kind of right. You know? Um, so I, I believe in that a lot. And then the other thing about bodybuilding is that there's a, my muscle connection, you know, Arnold talked about it. It's like learning how to actually control your muscles with your brain, like, you know, motor control, you just learn it. And I learned it through bodybuilding reps, but I also learned it through flexing in the mirror. Mm. You know, I'm like a teenager. I'm like, you know, I'm like, how do you, oh, how do I flex those, those upper back muscles? It's like, I just, I learned how to basically, you know, flex my rhomboids. Or most people are like, what's a rhomboid? They have no idea. So you're like, okay, let's go do this exercise. Let's go do a pull-up. Let's get your upper back. Let's get your shoulders to depress before you pull with your arms. They're like, what are you talking about? It's like, I'm like, I get that. I know how to move those things because I was trying to do a rear, you know, double bicep and figure out how to make it look cool in the mirror, mm -hmm. right? So there's uh, there's such beauty in in taking pieces of that world be like, oh, that's how it makes people actually understand their bodies better. It's not just about being vain and looking good in the mirror and posing in trunks on the stage. It's about, I learned how to flex these muscles and that's valuable when you want to move for the rest of your life. Bodybuilding is amazing uh, for you know being a, a type of sport that you can uh, participate in forever. Yeah. Um, you know, when will your luck run out with three sets of 10 on something like it? Just the intensity can change over the years, you know, yeah. from the time you're, you know, 30 to the time you're 50 to the time you're 70, you can make adjustments in whatever ways you need to, uh, along the way. It doesn't have to always look the same way as, uh, you were pointing out, like going from machine to machine and you probably did like 20 sets for a body part <laughs> yeah. and things like that. There'll be moments where maybe you want to lean into stuff like that more. And there might be moments where you're like, I just need, you know, two exercises per body part or something like that. But bodybuilding is is fantastic you can that's kind of where i think just about everyone has started mm -hmm. was with just your typical whether it be like they were really trying to like bodybuild or whether they started with just randomly three sets of 10 whether they knew it or not or whether they were intentional or not they pretty much started with yeah some sort of bodybuilding protocol sure and it's almost impossible you know it, it, there's always probability of like getting hurt when it comes to anything in the gym but following these kind of uh, bodybuilding principles, as long as you're not, you know, trying to lift the most amount of weight or you start to do the exercises too often or something like that, it's, it's difficult to, to get hurt unless you're going to that kind of, uh, you know, real high level, but you're right. going to see a lot of injuries when you're talking about power lifting, when you're talking about, uh, Olympic lifting. Um, but again, even with power lifting, you can power lift forever. You can power lift from the time you're 10 until the time you're 90. But it, you, if there's a there's a requirement of you not going too far. Yeah, and I think that that's the tendency with bodybuilding. People typically don't go too far because the rep range is usually somewhere appropriate between you know sure. eight to twelve reps, where your intensity is going to be lower. Yeah, so many things just came to mind as you were saying all that. Um, I think one is you know with bodybuilding, one of the challenges that people do run into is that if they're not really creative or they don't really have a good handle on the training concepts, they do get bored. Mm. They're like, ah, it's like the same three sets of 10, you know, like 
it's leg day again, it's bicep day, you know, there's a the boredom factor that that hits a lot of people. Um, you know, it's a it's a rare person that's like, I've hit the same bodybuilding routine for the last 30 years and I'm just get, get, I love it. I'm getting after it. So functional training, you know, quote unquote functional training adds in a, an element of variety to these concepts. And that's again where the the blend for me was so powerful. It's like cool, we're going to keep doing these things that work, that can work for decades, but you're bored of it. So then I'm sorry, it stopped working. You know, you can't, you're not going to be consistent with something you hate and something you're bored of. So let's bring in some things that are, are nuanced, different, fun, variety, get you trying to learn a new skill. The other thing is that I think people in the gym doing bodybuilding routines that don't have a good movement, uh, like, you know, history, um, they don't have good awareness of their bodies. If they're just hitting machines and they've never really learned how to move their bodies in a free weight setting or something like that, um, that's where I think those people end up getting injured. You know, they end up getting put in positions that maybe aren't really mechanically sound for them and they do thousands of reps. Mm -hmm. And like, ah, I, I can't I can't bench press any, or I can't hit the chest press machine anymore because of my this is bothering me. And they're not pushing like maximum weights. They're just been in cockeyed positions for three years and it catches up to them. So I like that as a, you know, a principle to teach people. It's like, we did, we did all that slow tempo work today. Mm -hmm. Hey, let me teach you how to move by really slowing things down and getting you to connect with good positions. And then now it's like, we just did a big, uh, a big redesign of our gym back in San Rafael. It used to look like very traditional functional, you know, training gym. Now it's like a hybrid. It's got, we got a bunch of Atlantis strength machines in there. I've got, you know, the the Smith machine. I've got several leg, you know, curl, leg extension, cable machines. And I'm like, yeah, we're blending these together because I can get onto those machines that might put me into a fixed position, but I have great awareness of my body. I know how to move because I've learned how to do it in both settings. And that's only now going to enhance my my ability to contract muscles, to body build, to get a good stimulus, to keep me engaged for a long time. And it's not going to set me up for injury because I know how to move and I've continued to try and explore good movement uh, on top of getting a good pump. And, you know, one big thing that a lot of people can kind of try to do is get away from the idea of always increasing your intensity, especially when you do things with the functional bodybuilding in mind. Because, you know, for example, we're doing this Philly Zercher press, right? Um, you have to keep the, you have to keep your scapular position here and you have to be pressing right here. You're not going to continuously just be increasing that load if you're not controlling your tempo. Yeah. And a lot of people, when they're like, oh God, I only have, I can only use 30 or 35 pounds here. I'm usually Arnold pressing 50s. That can be an ego blow for some people, yeah. even though they're getting a lot of good work there and a lot of other large range of motion movements. Yeah. But if you can slowly work on regressing, taking that load down mm -hmm. and slow progressively over, slowly progress that over time, your movement's going to be so much better in general in yeah. life. Yeah, I think I think well, absolutely. And I, you know, you mentioned the ego piece, and that's always going to be a, a challenge for a certain type of individual. I actually don't believe it's like the. The majority of people, I think most mm -hmm. people come into training with like no ego. They're like, I don't, you know, it's like, you got to tell them like, oh, you can go up another five pounds. Like, mm -hmm. it's okay. Um, there's always going to be somebody that's like, you know, I got to be lifting the most. And that's where some of these principles that we talked about today help, right? It's like tempo, tempo you know, awkward grips, deficits, different positions. It's like, they're, it's going to self-limit, you know, here, oh, you want to lift 300 pounds? Sorry. Like, your grip's going to give out after the third rep and you're safe. You know, mm -hmm. you can't, you can't grind out your 10th rep, you know, when your grip fails on the fat grip. Um, but yeah, I think that in finding ways to empower the person that's in, that's intimidated is really like, that's, that's the win. If you can figure out that for the masses, you know, how do we get people to come in and actually try and lift the weights and that going back to the CrossFit thing, that's why I jumped on that so heavily early on was, you know, I've been lifting weights for 10 years before CrossFit was even in my, in anybody's sphere of awareness. Nobody was racing to the, there weren't hordes of people running to the gym to power lift or to body build. It was kind of, you were a fringy type of person. Mm -hmm. Now everyone was banging, like, sign me up to do cleans, sign me up to do the swings. And I was like, whoa, like everybody suddenly wants to come and learn how to lift weights. Like, and they're kind of inspired to go and lift heavier. I'm like, this is cool. I want to be 
in this, this mode as a coach who's trying to make a career in health and fitness, I want to be on the front lines with average everyday person coming in saying, yeah, I heard this is cool. Uh, I hear you like lift weights. Like I want to do that. I'm like, awesome. I've been trying to get people to come to the gym with me for the last 10 years and nobody wanted to come. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, for a long time, all that anyone knew was bodybuilding. Yeah. And then all that anyone knew was like the real high level bodybuilding. And maybe people just didn't understand the empowerment that can go on from lifting weights yeah. until they had the vehicle of like CrossFit to kind of drive that message home Yeah, where they're like, oh, okay, it's, you're climbing ropes too, and you're doing cleans and you're doing all these other movements and it just kind of looks cool. Yeah. And then to see the bodies that came out of there with both the men and the, and the females, you know, people started looking uh, awesome. And on top of that, it, there wasn't the diet component to it as much, or you didn't yeah. see it as much. It wasn't like people trying to like not eat and work out. Sure. It's like people were getting, uh, people were gaining muscle mass and they were getting stronger. And I think that became something that uh, kind of swept, at least in this country, it gained, gained some ground and then it started kind of spreading all over the yeah. place. Yeah. I mean, I think there were two ways to look at it. It was like, you might've been in the camp of like being a little bit bitter about it. Like, Hey, I've been trying to get people to do this for the last 10 years and I wasn't successful. And now this random, you know, group of people comes out doing crazy burpees and stuff. And now everyone wants to like pay attention to it or could be like, great. Finally, people are showing up. <laughs> let's go talk about it. Let's go do it. Let's and let's do it better. You know, I had plenty of people that were telling me like, Hey man, that's dangerous. You shouldn't do that. Like you shouldn't coach people like that. I'm like, okay, but at least I'm, we have a chance to coach them. So yeah, it, it's not perfect, but let's make it better. And that's kind of, that's got to be the driving, you know, if you're really into like making change for people, helping them, that, that's, sh I believe that should be the attitude forever. If you're in this industry, it's like, you got people coming. That's a good thing. Now do better each mm -hmm. time by them, right? Make it more effective for them. Make it safer for them. Make it something that they can do for 10, 20, 30 years. Make it Make it accessible, more accessible, functional bodybuilding, more accessible. Anytime I see something that creates an obstacle to somebody doing it more, I got to fix it, you know, and an injury that creates an obstacle for people, you know, uh, doing too much intensity so that they can't show up for their kids and, you know, be focused at their job. That's an obstacle, you know, and then, oh, this, we didn't even talk about diet. Now people are not seeing the results that they want. That's an obstacle. We got to talk about that. So you just keep leveling up, leveling up with more and more experience. And you realize that it really just is about keeping it super simple for people in the long run. You had some different ways of changing the intensity of our workout today. Uh, once we got to like a certain weight and once we were like warmed up, we just kept the weight the whole time. Um, and I think that people, maybe some folks that just haven't got into strength training much, they don't really understand this principle. Like the weight is just one variable. Mm. The weight is just one variable of intensity, but there's so many other things you can do. You mentioned the the different grips. Yeah. You mentioned the tempo. You mentioned Charles Poliquin. Um, you mentioned, uh, or even just in the confines of our workout, we had kind of a impeded fatigue. Like we didn't have an opportunity to like rest seven minutes so that we can have the most optimal set every time. Yeah. How have you incorporated a lot of this into your bodybuilding stuff that you're doing? Functional bodybuilding. Yeah, I think it's that's you just summarize it so well. I mean, I, I, I'm always uh, you know trying to solve for problems, right? That's what we were just talking about, or I was just saying, and you know, I was coming, I was coming out of a community that was very committed to intensity, and the measures of intensity were were there were only a couple. It was do more reps, do them faster, or do them heavier, right? And those, it was just, it was just three. You had three options. And if you went to the gym and you didn't outperform any one of those three, it was then assumed you weren't getting good training. You weren't, you know, you weren't going to get leaner. You weren't going to get stronger. Mm -hmm. You were a failure. I had a lot of people that were emotionally like struggling with this in their later years. Were like, I just can't get myself up to beat my old time. Like, I just don't want to do it. I'm like, it's, and they felt shame for that. Oh, what about the anxiety attached to it uh, yeah. about a specific workout coming up on Friday and it's only Monday. Yeah. People were flipping. I remember. Totally flipping. It's max out Friday, you know, <laughs> every day. Right. And that's stressful. And so that was why I was like, Hey, what are, let's look at all the variables that can raise intensity or just make workouts more challenging. Mm. Right. And 
when I find those, I'm like, okay, I got to hang on to that. I got to hang on to that. Oh, if I just change the grip, that made it more challenging. If I just change the tempo, if I put my feet up on a block, added some range of motion, that made it more challenging. Like, let's just compile these ways of increasing the intensity that are that go beyond the the three that I was I was so married to for so long. Mm. And by let's say now we have twenty options to increase intensity. There's more. You know, the rest period alone is something that in weight training uh, I don't think people identify as so powerful often enough. I just did a set of 15 on the bench press and I sat around for three minutes and then I did another set of 15. Okay, well, what about do 15, rest 60 seconds, go do a set of deadlifts, rest 60 seconds, come back and actually be structured about that. That'll change the intensity, the, the metabolic stress, the metabolic load of that workout and give you a way to make training whatever, Harder, burn more calories, uh, you know, make you feel like you got a good session in, sweat more, breathe more, all those things. It's easier to do with other folks too. Yep. Like if you're trying to do like a 700 pound deadlift workout, you know, it's, it's hard to change the weights and try to figure out like, how do I incorporate anybody else? But now when you train like this, you can invite anyone at any time to train with you, which is motivational and it's going to keep you uh, on point a little easier. Yeah. So any of these, uh, you know, doing heavy cleans or heavy snatches or any, they're all great, but how cool is it that you can kind of work out with just about anybody? Cause you yeah. can just change the weights a little bit. You might not even need to change the weights because right. you might be ending up in someone else's kind of wheelhouse. If, uh, if you're doing three or four movements in a row, even if it's still a movement that you're really strong on, yeah. you still might be dying when you're trying to do it because you can't breathe. Yeah. I mean, what I know now about how I'm delivering training, it's like, I kind of miss, like, I don't coach group fitness anymore. We don't have a group fitness gym. We're out of that. But if I could go back and bring this, this, these concepts into the group fitness gym, you know, two weeks ago is my, my wife's birthday and, and what she wants and what she misses. She's like, I miss the group class. I'm like, I get it, babe. Like we don't. So we got together a few people. Nate came like my business partner. I was there. My wife was there. We had like a little small group workout. We did a functional bodybuilding workout and I think we all got done and we were just like, so we're so jazzed. Mm -hmm. We're like, dude, we just did a group workout with like four people with very different fitness levels. We this all was for her birthday. This is what she wanted to do for her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> right before we went out to brunch. That's, that's sick. <laughs> it was cool. Um, but like, like you said, it's, it, it can be very communal in that way. And there's, and, and it really does with these principles and elements brought in, it, it does kind of make it feel very like, well, I don't even know how to compare to what this other person's doing because I'm doing my own thing over here and I'm counting reps and tempos and I'm working hard and they're working hard and okay, great. Like there's no time on the board. Like we didn't go and, you know, smash the, the button and be like, I'm done, time. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I think you finished first, which is fine. I'm okay. I don't, I don't think I did. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's like, it's just, it, it is a very, in my, obviously my opinion, but a fun communal way to, to train that that doesn't, separate people based upon their performances it brings them together i have experience with training with training with crossfitters before and the only times that i've ever really worked out with crossfitters they've been like mutant crossfitters <laughs> they've all been like crossfit game athletes and sometimes yeah. even champions and a few times like i remember working out with uh with ben smith i was like oh this is kind of cool because like i'm kind of like a halfway partially sort of in some weird way still kind of hanging with him and i know i wasn't really hanging with him he's like let me hang with him but then it did it's separation started go like this and then like that and just wider and wider and i was like oh my god he's like totally fucking killing me <laughs> and the same thing happened with Kalipa before and a couple other people so on one of those like rounds that we were doing i was like you started kind of speeding up a bit and i was like oh i was like i better get my shit together otherwise i'm gonna end up like getting lapped a couple times so <laughs> mm -hmm. i got a little anxious there i was like i better move my ass yeah um we have that ben patrick seminar coming up on october 24th yeah and i know that you've done some stuff with him and i've seen additions of like movements that he's talked about into your functional bodybuilding programs. Those movements have helped out my knees a ton, by the way. They're night and day from when they what they were in February. But how, uh, what concepts were you able to take from there? How was it beneficial for you? What What are you like adding into functional bodybuilding that maybe wasn't there before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of things. Um, I've, you know, I I think I I got to meet or virtually meet Ben in March or April. I think I was just like many people just oh knees over toes guy instagram 
you know, went down the rabbit hole immediately. Mm -hmm. And I started doing his program and, and just doing things. And then one day he like messaged me. He's like, oh my God, you're doing this stuff. And um, he's like, I'm a big fan. And he, I, re I realized he had been following me for like a six months or a year. And we just, he just, he gave me his phone number right away. He's like, text me anytime. And I'm like, really? Are you serious? Like, that's really generous. Like, I hope... I wonder if you do this with everybody. Like that seems kind of you're opening the door to a lot of uh, questions. I was like, oh, cool, man. I appreciate. It. I promise I won't blow you up too much. And then, you know, if you've been in a text message thread with him and he gets going, it's like you're like, <laughs> it's, it's like four pages of text and you haven't even been able to write. Like, yeah, hey, is he at a computer or something? I know. He told me once. He's like, yeah, I answered every single customer message for like two years from my phone. And I got really fast. And I was like, apparently. <laughs> like, but um, yeah, things that I took from him early on were, you know, a history of like some in injuries through through sports and CrossFit. Um, I have been on a journey of like, I want to train. I want to challenge my body for a long time. And I don't want to be impacted by, and I don't want to be held back by injuries. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's a big thing for me. And so I'm like, what do, what does it take to to challenge myself, to push that limit, but not overdo it. And when I really attached to some of what he was talking about, which is like you do certain movements and you do the right amount of them at these standards, you can bulletproof a joint. I was like, okay, yeah, that's that resonates with me. How do I bulletproof every joint of my body? And then the concepts are, well, you develop strength through range. You do things like slam board squats or positional strength elements, you do them and you look at the upstream and the downstream joints and the strength of those muscles and you really kind of understand. I mean, he took my concepts that I had already been thinking about of like strength balance, about bulletproofing, about longevity, and it was just an elegant system. I was like, oh, this makes so much sense. And then the other thing that really struck me with Ben was the way he delivered his programs as like kind of a you don't need anything to start. This is body weight. It's very, it's very fundamental. And then you can progress. He was really, I think he's really a master of showing the regression concept and making it feel really empowering to people versus like, oh, I'll go do the scaled version, right? And that's, that's so important because mo most people are not going to be able to come in and do the workout we did today the way we did it. We need to regress it, but we need to make it regressed in a way that feels like, yes, like, I'm having a win today. I feel really good. And he makes you feel like you're having a win by doing your first set of body weight tib raises. You're just like, oh my God, I got a wicked pump just by, you know, putting my butt against the wall and lifting my toes. Um, and then as we got to talking more, just we I just realized like he and I had so many, you know, commonly held beliefs about the uh inclusion of things, not the exclusion of like, like, oh, that's good. I'll use that, you know. Mm -hmm. And he was like, he was such a he was such a sponge with anything I was throwing at him. I'm like, hey, I did this workout today. I did that. You know, he came and did a, a functional bodybuilding workout like that. And he's like, oh, I'm taking this information. I'm using it. I'm gonna go practice it. And I thought that was just, you know, really inspiring too. It's like somebody's like, Oh, that's cool. I'm gonna stick to my thing over here, you know, like oh, I'm too good for that, or I, I won't touch that because it's it's not my thing. Um, that's fine, but it also is not how I feel about, you know, this about fitness and about, you know, longevity and, and creating, you know, consistency for people. Mm -hmm. yeah, the stuff that he does, I mean, it works, you know, I know like we incorporated it is when he was here. And one thing I think that's really interesting about some of it, and you mentioned this earlier about you didn't know if you would have enough time to like do, you know, multiple workouts a day. I feel like with people like Ben Patrick, that sometimes they're showing you like something so simple. You're just like, Oh, I can, I could, I could throw that in a couple times a week yeah. and it gives you like another thing to do a week and it's not necessarily like a workout. Yeah. It's more like just exercise. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it's like part of, it's just part of like your, your body hygiene, you know, you brush yeah. your teeth and it's like, well, why not move your elbows around too? Like take care of, you know, take care of your teeth. Why not take care of your, you know, not just your bones of your body, but take care of some of your joints. Yeah. Move your shoulders around a little bit, move your knees around a little bit, your hips. Yeah. And, and it's going to be different for each person. Like, you know, some people are going to have to pay a lot more attention to it. So for me, uh, I'm just thinking like, 
some of the stuff that he showed, there's some things that are more complex and more yeah. difficult for me to uh, do that I just don't necessarily enjoy because they're harder, but yeah. they would they would clearly benefit me. But I adapted at least some of it. I'm like, okay, I, those three, four things, I could see putting those into my life and having those be part of my day-to-day. I went and I ran the other day. Um, a, a while back, I was running and my knee got a little uh, swollen and got a little screwed up. And uh, so I had to go back and, and do more knees over toes stuff. I mm-hmm. had to work on the tibs and do a bunch of different stuff. And sure enough, the a lot of the pain subsided. But it's been, I don't even know how long. It's probably been decades since I've been able to like decelerate my body. Mm. I actually, at some point in my life, I used to be pretty fast. I used to be able to sprint pretty good. Uh, but I, <laughs> I got to a point where I couldn't slow down, you know, yeah, yeah, right. kind of juggernaut. Right. Um, but, uh, yeah, more recently I, I went for, I did some sprints. I did like 12 sets of sprints and I was able to not to stop on a dime or anything. It still took me a while to slow down. I was still being very cautious, but that's exactly what Ben's talking about is that you're in a knee over toe position yeah. when you're doing some deceleration. So the shit works great. Yeah. I mean, it, the, the, the results and, and the efficacy of, of some of his systems you know, they speak for themselves as long as you do them. And, um, but again, like back to like, what about him really stood out or what, what, what had the relationship grow? Um, it was that like what you said, it's like, you don't have to make this your hundred percent thing that you do. You know, you can take elements from it. And that to me is very aligned with how I feel about functional bodybuilding. It's like, I don't want, I don't need you to be a hundred percent all in on functional bodybuilding because truly it's, that's not what it's about. It's about you know, maybe those, that tempo superset that we did, you know, that concept, maybe you do two of those a week, you know, in place of your five sets of five, you know, and now you're getting a different stimulus in your training and you learn that. Or maybe that like work capacity thing we did with the sleds and with the, you know, swings and with the floor presses, like, okay, you know, let me incorporate that once or twice a week. Cause it's going to help you with you know, learning how to control your breathing while actually putting out, you know, some power and some resistance, which might translate well to your, you know, jujitsu. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that, again, comes from solving a problem that I felt for years, which was, you know, people got into the sport of CrossFit or the, you know, and it was like CrossFit or nothing. I'm a hundred percent. It's like, this is my, this is my thing. It's like, and so it didn't leave room for anything else. It's like, oh, you want to come and how do you just dip your toe into it? It's like, I just want to try a little bit of it. It's like, no, no, you got to do the whole thing. It's like, no, you don't have to do the whole thing. You just take elements that really can work for you. And I, I want to expose people to a lot of different methodologies inside of this program, inside of our approach, so that like, hey, six out of 10 of them work really well. I'm going to keep using them. Mm. Yeah, we've got people that love all 10 out of 10 and they're, they're our diehards. But you know, it's like at the end of the day, even if you just take, two of the principles and you're using them every week, that's a win and that's helping people. And I think Ben really believes that. And, and I use, you know, I use some of his, his zero knees over toes, uh, ATG system program concepts to warm up my knees any day I squat. It's like, okay, I'm just, I just do these things. I got my monkey foot. I got my slam board. Mm-hmm. I got my, t- you know, I got my tip bar and I just knock them out and I'm feeling good and I squat and you know, that's it. And I don't need to, I don't need to like, invest you know in the, in the whole system and do nothing else yeah throughout today uh charles poliquin's name's come up quite a bit i've heard you mention yeah. him quite a bit ben's mentioned him quite a bit mark small has mentioned him right so what have you what have you learned uh or maybe some big concepts do you think um you learned and maybe you've been utilizing that were from charles poliquin yeah um it's it's interesting i think uh you know one of the like an i i don't know we probably all have an experience of like I had an eye-opening workout with at some point in my life. A lot of people that I've met over the years had that eye-opening experience with CrossFit. They came in. It was the baseline workout that we did for new members. They would row 500 meters, do 40 air squats, 30 sit-ups, 20 push-ups, 10 pull-ups. That 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 format would make one out of three people throw up. Mm-hmm. The other two people were just you know, obliterated. They're like, what? You know, So they had that eye-opening moment. I had my, my eye-opening workout moment after probably three, four years of going and doing the machines. My, my cousin, who was, he was, lived in Tahoe City, uh, he, they, he and his family owned the Ironworks gym in Tahoe City, right 
by the Safeway there. Uh, it was a McDonald's. Um, he got into training. He was like probably 18. I was like, thir- or he was like 20. I was 13. And he was like going through a big bodybuilding, bulking diet. He was eating like 30 eggs a day. I don't know. It just seemed absurd to me at the time, but he was just massing. He was getting big right. and he was doing these workouts and they were, you know, he was like, yeah, come and work out with me today. I was like, cool. You know, I'm, I'm, I love working out. I want to lift weights. I'm with my cousin, Brian. Let's get after it. We go into the gym. Smith machines loaded with 95, 115 pounds. He's got me and his two buddies and he's trying to like orchestrate this like workout, but like, he's like, we got to do this tempo thing. We're going to do these tempos and like, we got rest periods and he's like trying to tell me what to do. And you know, his workout got totally fucked cause he was just babysitting me and this other guy, <laughs> but he's like basically taking us through a split squat, a Smith machine split squat at a very slow tempo into strict chin ups with the neutral grip. And he's over there basically doing shoulder presses because I'm, I'm crapping out. He's like, you got to stick to the tempo. He's like crushing me on this tempo. And the rest periods were short. And it was like, I don't remember the reps, but it was this Pollockin. It was a Pollockin program, Ger- German body comp program. And on set three, we had just started. Set three, I threw up. I was p- on the floor in the bathroom upstairs for a while at their gym. My mom and my aunt come. You know, later on, they're like, what did you do to Mark? Like, what happened to him? He's on the floor. And I was just wrecked. And I, re- I remember leaving the gym and be like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to get this workout. Like, I'm going to come back and do this again. And I like mm-hmm. went back home, was at the gold gym in Marin, tried to do it two more times, threw up both times. Like it just kept crushing me. I was like, this is insane. And so a couple of years go by. And of course I learned more about what the system was and what I was doing. And then in college, like. I pulled back out some of those old programs, did it with a buddy and got into the best, like the best physical shape of my life. I was like ripped in college for the first time ever. And so those principles, Pollockan principles just really stuck with me. And then the years go on and I just sort of, you know, paid attention to what he was saying and, um, you know, get little nuggets about, you know, how to optimize muscle mass. And, and then of course, in his later years, he really started to talk about like, you know, nutrition, holistic wellness, like, you know, spiritual stuff as well. Just sort of understanding, like, what does it mean to, to really be a complete, whole, healthy person beyond the sets and the reps too? I have a a binder of every single article he's ever written. Wow. I'm like a mega fan and he was, he was a friend. So we lost, we lost an amazing person. You know, it's, it's devastating. The information that that guy, that that guy died with, uh, it's just brutal that he, I mean, he still had so much more to share, you know, yeah. and he was, uh, he was, uh, truly, uh, truly amazing. Um, one of the things that I, uh, you know, took from him was, was these, uh, ideas of, uh, of the tempo training type stuff. And you just take a simple exercise, like just a, a hammer curl, you know, and try to go, you know, three or four seconds on the way up, hold it for a second and go three or four seconds on the way down. I mean, it just makes the exercises really uh, brutal. The other thing that he did is he would superset a lot of stuff. As you're talking about, you're pointing out there, he would do, uh, you know, opposite muscle groups, you know, mm-hmm. so he might, or opposing muscle groups, he might do biceps and triceps. He might pair chest and back, and he might pair quads and hamstrings. Um, I've had a, a, I've had some amazing people that I've worked out with over the years, uh, but uh John Cena was somebody that I got, had an opportunity to work out with here and there. And he used to kill me. We, we would work out. He, he loves just straight up bodybuilding stuff. And John does the craziest workouts. He's like, oh, today we're doing Indianapolis 500. I'm like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> and it's like 500 reps on a leg press with just as much weight as you can handle. I'm like, none of this makes any, what are we doing? You know, and I'd be sore for like three weeks, you know, and he's laughing because he's just a fucking animal. And so he's just knocking the shit out of me here and there with some training sessions. And then he's like, Hey, you know what? Go ahead and pick whatever you want to do. And I was like, all right, we're going to do some squats and we're going to do some leg curls in between the squats, Poliquin style. So we're doing this tempo stuff and he's never messed with any of it before. He ends up throwing up. He ends up just yeah. like turning like really <laughs> pasty white. And I'm like, I got this motherfucker. I'm like, this is fucking great. Cause he crushed me so many other times and made me feel so sick. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, What's the ki- what's the king of all you know variables in the gym? You know, it's like well, people talk about reps. It's all about the sets. It's all it's like the, the tempo actually is what dictates everything. The outcome, you know, in in powerlifting, there's a tempo to that. It's just 
fast. And it's, you know, you're not, you're not trying to like, I, my limited understanding of training for powerlifting is we're trying to build explosive, you know, strength, like fast, move shit fast. And well, that's a tempo. And then in, in a different setting, the tempo changes and the goal is hypertrophy. And then, mm-hmm. well, if you understand that tempo is just giving you access to the ways that muscles can contract fast, slow, isometrically, you know, and everything in between, then you can start to play with a lot of cool stuff in the gym. And yeah, I think people are um, introduced to the concept of weight training as a, you know, point A to point B concept. You just move, you just got to go through the range of motion and then versus like, you got to go through the range of motion at this pace. And whoa, that that's different. And that could fix a lot of problems. It could fix, you know, people learning good technique. It could fix mm. people overloading too soon and being, you know, lifting weights that are their their connective tissue is not ready for. Um, so yeah, it's that's you know, it seems so simple, but oftentimes the simplest thing is what has the most value. I think Ben taught taught me that with knee with knee ability. It's like it's just keep it simple. Like you've got to train through a full range of motion. You know, ATG split squats, slant board squats, all the he's just going deep. <laughs> he's bend the knee, bend the knee over the toe. That's the concept. And it's like with weight training, understand tempo, 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 tempo. And, and you know, someone's like, ah, oh, I don't want to count. It's like, great. You, you know, you, you're not the thinking athlete yet. You haven't absorbed this stuff and, and you're not going to be able to do it as long. And then when it breaks, then we can come back and we'll talk about tempo and you'll be into it. I remember Charles Poliquin was talking early on too about the knees over toes stuff. Cause he, he was, uh, uh, training like speed skaters and people from all different sports where it was really important that they had a uh, really good integrity of the knee. And I re- even remember in a lot of the stuff that he would write, when you saw a workout from him, there was a, it was like, it looked like a prescription or something. Like you yeah. couldn't read, if you didn't know how to read it, you didn't know what the hell was going on. Cause it would say like four, three, four. And you're like, what does all that mean? It's like, right. well, it means, you know, four seconds on the way up, four seconds on, or three second pause. And then a four seconds on, yeah. you know. And you're just like, oh my God, okay, he's, he's writing the tempo. He wrote everything into the workout. The, yeah. The rest protocol, like everything was spot on. If you followed it, um, you you got some you got some results that were exponentially way faster than anything you've ever done before. Yeah. It's fucking the, amazing. He there there was a it's like a thin paperback book, German body composition. It's green. It's got a picture of him on the front coaching this female athlete lifting. And I don't know what, you know, I think it was written in ninety, maybe. Um, and it went out of print, so it's hard to get your hands on. I had a copy, I had it at the gym. Somebody stole it, somebody Aww. borrowed it. Went to go, I was like, okay, I'm gonna go get a new one. 500 bucks, what? Like this little paperback nothing book is 500 bucks? I'm like, I'm not, I don't think it's worth that much right now. I'm not gonna pull the trigger on it. Fast forward like two, three years ago, I've talked about it so much because this is the book that I like followed the workout that made me throw up. My business partner bu- finds one and buys it for me for my birthday. It's like, mm-hmm. it's like a good condition book. I'm like, so I've got it like in a special place in my 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 shelf. But what's interesting in that book is that I remember this. There's some cool, you know, photographs of all the exercises. He's got the workouts and then these how you do the exercises. I've been coaching split squats for a while. And when I got introduced to it is essentially like a, a split squat doing 90 degree hip and, hip and knee angles, not knees over toes style. But I always had this burn in my brain that like when I look at the split squat exercise picture in Pollock's book, it's the female athlete doing a, a knees over toes ATG split squat, like Ben's style, like way out there, knee way over the toe and using a little uh, elevation on one with her foot on the front, front foot elevated and one with the rear foot elevated, still getting that way knee over the toe. And I always had that burn in my brain. And when I saw Ben doing his stuff, it made me think immediately of that book. And I like pulled it out. I'm like, oh yeah. He's doing it. He didn't have, he didn't call it an AT. It was just a split squat. This is how you do a split squat. And he was a firm believer in like, you know, that's been Ben talks about it too. It's like, get your knees strong over the toe. You're going to have fewer injuries. You're going to be performing better on the field and your sports. Mm-hmm. Someone that I always had to bring up sometimes from time to time is um, Mike O'Hearn. Because like Mike O'Hearn is 50 something years old, but when you look at his training, when you look at what he's moving, first off, he's moving some disgustingly heavy loads, but slow, Mm. like really slow with really controlled tempo. And he's one of those individuals who's been able to be so resilient throughout all his training career, even though he's lifted some crazy weights and he's 50 something years old, 
but he's moving better than guys that are in their 30s, hmm. right? Partially probably because he's slowed a lot of things down and got strong with those ranges um, over the years. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and then, of course, there's people listening that play sports that need to be fast and, yeah. you know, slow tempo training, probably not the predominant, um, you know, focus that you should be, you know, using in your, in your training, and that's fine, but... Um, when those people are the inspiration to everyday people, they think, oh, well, these people train fast. They tra train heavy. They train explosive. I need to do that. It's like, no, no, no. Let's use the same movement patterns, but slow it down. I think it works way better for the gen pop and the person that I'm really trying to help, you know, go from, from off the couch or just getting started or not having success with their consistent, you know, they, they just been inconsistent and it's like, no, let's, let's get you doing these things for a long time. I believe it's referred to as strength aerobics, which sounds ridiculous, uh, but uh, it is also uh, tempo training is utilized often when people have an injury. Yeah. Uh, and I've, I've torn pecs and hamstrings and all kinds of different things. And when I've come back from those injuries, I had to train really slow. Uh, one of the things we did today, we did a slower version of, uh, of a deadlift with a trap bar deadlift, three seconds on the way up, three seconds on the way down. Um, I've done sets before where you do like 15 reps like that. And yeah. it's just, uh, I got it from James Smith who, uh, has been on our show before it, it just, again, it makes you want to throw up like the, the metabolic cost of, of doing an exercise like that. So people that are trying to look to bring some new intensity to their workout, maybe they haven't messed around with some of these things. Uh, these are amazing ways to work out and they can also help you to kind of restore tissue. So if you have a bad elbow or bad shoulder, Find exercises that allow you to train with a weight that doesn't hurt, move super duper slow, um, you know, maybe have uh, each set last 40 seconds to 60 seconds or something like that. And uh, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked at what it can do for the health of your shoulder, the health of your joints. I think, um, you know, something that you just said, it's like a, a kind of a guiding principle for a lot of what I do and how I evaluate the health and fitness landscape. What do people do when things go wrong? You know, you get injured, you got to train like this. Okay. But then you're not injured anymore. So what are you going to do? Go do the crazy shit that gets you injured. It's so interesting. It's like, we, okay, I'm out of pain now. Let's go and fuck our shit up again. Right. It's like, no, how do we keep these principles that get people out of pain, but keep them in there? And Ben and I, we went back and forth and created, I created workouts with him that I thought would showcase functional bodybuilding and his methods all in one. So basically what we did today, but using movements that are really integral to his system. Mm -hmm. And we ended up putting like an ebook together that we are selling on our you know site. And it was called Beyond Knee Pain. And the idea was, okay, you're out of pain now. What are you gonna do? You, you don't, don't go do the dumb thing over here that got you in knee pain in the first place bring these principles with you, bring the stuff that Ben is, you know, showing us, teaching us that is foundational to improving knee health and keep it as part of your, your regular routine, but you can increase intensity with these principles. Mm. And I think the same is true when I see people like they get all crazy with their diet. They're, they're eating this, they're doing that, they're changing their macros. They're, they're getting in the weeds with all the nuanced stuff and nutrition and it falls apart. Okay. What do I do? Uh, go back to eating three meals that are balanced with protein at the center of it and vegetables on the plate. Like just get back to the basics. And then once you've gotten back to the basics and you're feeling good and you're looking good, don't jump ship to, you know, the crazy, you know, nuanced macro diet. Like that was working. Just tweak it a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. don't go, don't go nuts and try and now go do the other thing. What are some of the things that um, you really utilize for recovery? We talked about sleep a little bit. Maybe we can talk more about that, how you structure that. But you also talked about that, you know, you have a dope sauna and a yeah. cold plunge at your house. Yeah. I'm just curious how maybe those things have played a part, if they play a part for you. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, we were saying, like, start with the one habit that's central and then add the next habit once it's become routine. And, mm -hmm. you know, eventually you create this whole, like, suite of, of healthy lifestyle factors. You know, I got the sun, I got the cold plunge, I got the hot tub, got the workout home at home gym. I got the, this, like I got the chili pad. I got all, you know, it's like, where do I, what, what's the biggest bang for your buck thing? You know, yeah. if I go back to it, it's 
it's food first. Mm -hmm. That's it. You know, uh, food and hydration and, uh, you know, getting quality foods, eating real food, as minimally processed food as possible, because that's going to allow me to eat the biggest volume of food, feel satiated, and also get micronutrients and, you know, make sure I'm not at a deficit in any place. Um, sleep is, is really important. Uh, a lot of, I think people spend a lot of time talking about the number of hours of sleep. I'm a big fan of talking about that sleep consistent window. When do you go to bed and when do you wake up? And can you make it the same time every single day? Mm. And I think starting there, whether it's six hours or five hours or eight hours, if it's, I'm always in bed at nine and I always wake up at 4.30 every day, seven and a half hours, that is super valuable to setting up good rhythms for myself. Because every day is almost, it's predictable in how I'm going to feel. Like I might have a bad night sleep last night because my daughter woke up a couple of times or it's not as perfect as the day before or whatever, but it's always about the same. And that way I can start to feel like this is what my body actually is supposed to feel like each day. And you become aware of when things are off. Mm. Whereas somebody is going to bed at one in the morning one day and 9 p.m. another day, and, you know, somewhere in between, and then they're sleeping in until 10 on the weekends, but then they're waking up at 5 on the work day. They're so dysregulated in terms of what their body feels like when they get up. They have no sense of what's normal, what's, what's their baseline. They're just bouncing all over the place. Um, so those are kind of, fo those are foundations. I've always been like, I get to bed at the same time, I wake up at the same time, eat relatively the same throughout the day, every day. Uh, and then... I, in the last couple of years, I really got into like, I, I think Kelly Starrett at one point, like I remember watching and he and Juliet like did the hot tub all the time. And he just talked about how great the hot tub was. And I was like, oh man, that's my dream. I want to have the hot tub. Like so that's, that's going to make me more supple, just like Kelly, like get in the hot tub, you mm -hmm. know? So I got the hot tub a few years back and then, and then sauna started to like, and then I see Laird doing it and Kelly's doing sauna. I'm like, oh, I got to get the sauna, you know? So I was like, I just wanted to like do the things that I saw the people doing. And I incorporated these into my like life. And um, I believe that heat is, you know, it's like the, the, the cardiovascular system, the vascular system, like the, the uh, venous return, the capillary beds, like this. And I read it. I, I don't know who wrote it. And they said it so eloquently. And it was just such a like, burn in my brain. It's like that system is designed for temperature regulation, being exposed to the elements, mm -hmm. having cold, and then it being hot. Like we didn't used to have these temperature control rooms when we were evolving. We were, in the, we were out in the world. It was hot, it was cold, you know, and, and our skin and the circulatory system underneath was forced to like kind of constrict and, and expand and dilate and, and manage temperature control. And so now hot exposure cold exposure in the in the cold tub that contrast doing it every day walking out because all these things are outside you know mm -hmm. i don't have my sauna inside i'm outside naked you know getting in the sauna getting in the cold tub and it's you know it's november and i mean in december it starts to be like 36 38 degrees and mm -hmm. we're in when you walk outside and you're, you're naked i'm like i'm actually doing some some real like paleo training here like this is what our bodies are supposed to do and i think that's i just have this belief that it's very healthy for our, for our vascular system and people are like marcus you're so vascular how do you get like that I'm like well you got to be lean enough to see the veins but i think you train them by like exposing yourself to different temperatures and so i that's kind of like a, i don't want to say it's like a secret weapon but i think it's just important to me and now it's like if I if we go and travel to a hotel for like a couple of nights and I don't have access to those things, I'm like, uh, I don't I don't feel right. You know, like something <laughs> feels off. Like I got to get in a, you know, d d like I run like the hottest bath that they can and the, and get get in that instead of the sauna. Mm -hmm. No, I, I I freaking love it too. I've been actually yesterday I went to this um this bathhouse called Asha Urban Bath down here in Sac and they have a great sauna. But I was just going from the sauna to the cold plunge to the sauna to the cold plunge, and it just felt amazing. I try to sauna a lot, but I want to get a cold plunge system. I want to get a sauna at some point because I honestly feel like, especially controlling breathing in there um, and controlling breathing in the cold, since I've been saunaing for so long, I think that that's one thing that's helped me to be able to control my breathing on the mat as far as jujitsu, control my breathing better when I'm working out in the gym, just to try to slow things down and keep things so I don't, you know, tap myself out. I think that makes a big difference there. Yeah. Hopefully someday research shows it, but I don't think we have that yet. Yeah, well, research is oftentimes 
pretty far behind, yeah. you know, practical applications in our industry. So I I know you're 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 hundred percent onto something. What do you got brewing over there, Andrew? I know you got questions. Uh yeah, well the chat room we've been going back and forth quite a bit today. So thank you everybody for um participating in the chat room. But one thing I was I was curious early because when you were talking about kind of um like you don't have to kill yourself every workout. Um which I agree with because since I've been doing that, I've been feeling a lot better and I've been able to do it every single day and I'm not, you know, murdering myself to where it's like I'm no longer a good husband. I'm no longer a good parent at the end of the day because I'm not present because I'm so tired. But for somebody to look like you, do they have to go through the years of beating the shit out of themselves in order to now slow down? Interesting. Yeah. Well, I. I mean, I've, I've heard you talk about this. It's like, it's not about beating yourself up. It's about putting in work, but mm -hmm. putting it in consistently for a long time. I think what we were discussing is that like you beat yourself up in the pursuit of something beyond what is average. You know, you want to be excellent. You're going to have to push the envelope. That's, but that was driven by something. It was driven by something inside of me that wasn't like, you know, I want to just look good. It's like I I was committed to like I need something. It's a deep desire to push yourself that much, and you need to have like you need to be a little crazy, and you need to have a little some some reason that is deep in you, and and that that likely won't last for forever for people. Um, so I I think it is truly about like create the consistency. What what most people can visualize as their best self is attainable through. Workouts that don't make you feel like death, just done long enough. You know, people look at the Arnold Schwarzenegger physique and they think, oh, that looks good, but I don't want to look like that. I just want to look like that. It's like, okay, well, if you want to look like Arnold, you better be ready to die, you know, on leg day, mm -hmm. you know. And if, but if you want to look like this, you know, it's not going to be easy, but you can get there if you give it enough time and if you do it consistently. Yeah. But yeah. also, if you were if you were to look back at your when you were at your highest level of like CrossFit, if somebody came into your gym and they went to do a workout with you, you'd fucking crush them. Yeah. So I think there's a misconception that like you're beat down. You know, like you you are you are taking it to yourself, but you are that's your current state. Like you're yeah. ready for all that shit. Um, I'd say the same was true for me. Like when someone came in the gym and lifted with me. Um, I could lift with anybody. I could lift with some of the strongest people in the world and sometimes beat some of the strongest people in the world at that time. But when I look back at it now, I'm like, that shit was fucking crazy. What yeah. was I doing? <laughs> totally. And now I can look back at it and be like, I think I had a misunderstanding of even what I was chasing. What, what, how was I so lost in any of that? But at the time, that's what I was doing. And mm -hmm. I, was, I was accepting of all the challenges and all the different things that were kind of going on at the time. So you do, I, in my opinion, you do not have to like beat the shit out of yourself uh, to be great. You do have to uh, find a way to always increase the challenges though. Yeah, that's Make true. them a little harder. Yeah, and I think if you have enough options to increase, yeah, you, you, you have to work hard and you have to work hard long enough and that's how you see results. It's just helping people dial in on like, what does it mean to work hard? Well, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, vomiting each workout. <laughs> Um, but it also doesn't mean like, oh, it's good. I'm good. You know, it's like <laughs> you better grunt, you know, you yeah. better, your grip might start to fail. You know, you might be like, where's the chalk? Like, I don't know if I can do this next set. Uh, those are questions that need to be surfacing. If you're in the gym and you're, you know, able to really pay attention to the, to the show on TV and follow the nuances of the characters, <laughs> it means you're probably not working hard enough. That's, that's a pretty good barometer there. Yeah. But cause when, when you walked in, you know, cause this is the first time I've seen you in person, you know, I've, I've seen all the pictures and so, and you look amazing and you know, you had your sweater on, I was just like, okay, like I don't look too far off from this guest, <laughs> yeah. you know, like, uh, we weigh about the same right now. Um, and so I'm like, okay, cool. And then you take your shirt off and I'm like, Jesus, like, okay, there's the pictures that I had seen, you know, and then all the vascularity and stuff. So that's, that's what got me thinking when you were talking about, you know, years of CrossFit working really hard and then now kind of slowing down and still getting the, uh, the stimulus and still getting, you know, progress and making that sort of thing. But literally as I'm asking the question, and Seema's voice pops in my head and it's like, it's just going to take more time. If yeah. we're going to slow down this way, then obviously that, um, uh, 
expecting it to happen in that short time frame is not going to happen. Yeah. You know, it might take double the time. And then another question that was kind of popping around the, um, the chat room, people start asking like what qual quantifies as something as far as like reps and sets for hypertrophy. But because that's kind of like a weird question to try to answer for a broad spectrum of people when it comes to the functional bodybuilding stuff, what, Cause like today you guys are doing sets of six, you know, you're, they're controlled tempo stuff. So I guess when it comes to that, like, are you able to say like this amount of reps per set is going to put us in hypertrophy or is it all just going to get you there just because of the duration of each uh, set? Yeah. It's, um, it's interesting because I think, you know, hypertrophy is not just a training, uh, variable. Like it's not just training variables. Like you, you can only grow if you eat enough to grow. And if you eat enough, pretty there's a lot of different ways to train that will make you get bigger muscles. You could be doing, you know, you could be an Olympic lifter who does one rep at a time and you're eating a lot and you'll, <laughs> the muscles will grow eventually, you know, and, um, or you could be like a traditional bodybuilder and do it that way. So in functional bodybuilding, what I like to teach people or talk about is less about the number of reps, less about the number of sets. What's your total time under tension in a set? And I like to aim for, you know, something north of 35, 40 seconds. So that was what we were kind of hitting today. It was like, I, I was doing sets of eight on the deadlift and each repetition was supposed to take six seconds. So, you know, the math on that is 48 seconds per set. I would say that's kind of hypertrophy, I, you know, ideal hypertrophy range. And similarly with the Philly press, kind of hitting similar uh, time under tension, if you add together the amount of time you're doing on both arms, and then the rest periods, like how much time in between sets. Um, we were in that 60 to, 60 to 90 second range resting between sets, not mm -hmm. three minutes. You know, you don't get a full recharge of your strength system. So that's kind of what I would, what I teach people. But you know, that method of training has been great for shredding body fat. It's also great for building lots of muscle because it has a stimulus that when paired with the right dietary approach mm -hmm. gets you the body you want. So be like, what's the best way to grow muscle? It's like eat more and mm -hmm. train, but eat more. It's like I can't build any muscle. It's like, cause you don't eat. And so not because you're not doing the right reps or not doing the right tempo. You're not doing the right, you know, weight. It's cause you just, you you were brought up and the way you learned the rhythm of eating food in your life was like this mm -hmm. and to grow you need to double that and that really is uncomfortable for people i'm that person like somebody the other day was like hey man if you put on a little body fat you're probably going to perform and feel better i'm like you're probably right <laughs> but that means i gotta uh, i burn four thousand calories a day I, to eat six thousand calories a day to get a little <laughs> bit more be meaty is uncomfortable to me. It's really uncomfortable. Uh, you know, I don't, I could do it one day a week, but I can't do it every day. And that's what it takes. Eat some pop tarts and Ben and Jerry's guarantee you'll get those calories. Exactly. In. It's like lower the quality, <laughs> lower the quality, find more processed food than you can do it. And I'm so opposed to that because of, you know, other core beliefs I have about health and wellness, but I get it. You know, it's like, so when people are like, that's I can't big, put them. That's a big deal though. Being a leader and being somebody that shares a message, like you don't want to like you could eat those things here and there and yeah. they, they could help you uh, maybe with performance or something, but you, you're sharing a message, you know, and totally. you want to try to be as like true to that as you can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then during the, uh, the workout, when you guys were talking about tempo, Mark, you had mentioned like, you know, because we are under so much uh, time under tension, like you're probably burning a lot more calories. I had never actually heard of that. Cause like I'm in my head, I'm thinking like an isometric hold, people will assume that they're going to get stronger. But as far as, as, as far as what I understand, you're only going to get strong in that one like isometric, uh, whatever you want to call it, range of motion. Mm -hmm. So I had actually never heard of literally just doing the same amount of reps and sets, but just doing them slower to actually burn more calories. I thought that was actually really like eye opening for me. Yeah, I'd have to look into it even further because it can get super complicated really quickly. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you will feel, you'll breathe heavier, you know, you'll, you'll notice you're going to probably perspire faster, you know, things like that. Um, started to tremble on yeah, the deadlifts. Yeah. Yeah. You start right? to, yeah, you start to shimmy and shake and you're like, mm, what's, what's some of that now? Could, could you burn more calories doing uh, eight sets of two with, uh, with enough rest to lift a heavy weight? Like could, like, let's say, let's say in SEMA, 
let's just say it did similar volume with 500 pounds in the deadlift versus using 225, which is going to burn more calories. If we went super slow at 225, or if he's lifting 500 pounds, I'd put my money on the 500 pounds. You know, even if we equated it properly, the weight, maybe that's too big a discrepancy, but you see my point, you know? And yeah. I, on, on the topic of hypertrophy, I think people make a big mistake in thinking that there's this, and, and you pointed it out, but there's a big mistake of thinking that things ha need to land in this like rep range. And there's even a big mistake in thinking that it needs to land in this time range. Though that information, first of all, is probably uh, super old. <laughs> But secondly, um, that information does not mean that when you do three repetitions that it's worthless for right. hypertrophy. And it also doesn't mean that when you do 30 repetitions uh, that it's worthless for hypertrophy. It just means that n under normal circumstances, under normal conditions, somewhere between 6 to 12 reps is usually ideal for hypertrophy, and it's a decent rule of thumb to follow. But what if we just start changing the game and start changing everything around it changes everything, right? Like, what if we do a drop set? Yeah. You know, what if we uh, do a giant set of the same body part? Right. I mean, now you're just getting into so many different variables. It's impossible to even study any of this stuff. And so it is nice to know some of these kind of general guidelines. It's like, okay, I can plug that in there. I can plug that in there. But don't forget that being able to lift heavier weight is going to assist you oftentimes in being able to increase the intensity of any lift and the more weight that you can lift over time, the easier that it will probably be to be bigger, like more muscular, maybe even more fit, but to a certain extent, to a certain point, you can get lost in any of that. Same thing with getting fit. Having a level of fitness is super important. Makes a lot of sense. The more fitness that you have, the more work you can do in a shortened and more condensed period of time, but you can get so carried away with that, that you're maybe not strong enough. Mm -hmm. to get in the volume and the work that you need. Mm -hmm. So I think you put it uh, really nicely in just saying like, it's just going to take long. It's going to take a long ass time because what are you in search of? You're in search of all of it. Yeah. And it's going to take a long ass time to get there. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and you everything you just said is completely accurate and right. And, you know, as we get further into the training universe, we learn that, oh, there's so many variables that really impact each other. And I also think it's very useful to have kind of cookie cutter answers that mm -hmm. are that are true for general population people getting into training because it's like, okay, I don't, you know, they they don't know what a drop set is yet. They don't know these other variables, but if they go into the gym and they try and hit six to twelve reps, they slow the tempo down a little bit. They get thirty to forty five seconds of of work for each set. That's that's a good starting place, and then they can learn that that's not the absolute only way mm -hmm. they can grow. Yeah, and, it's, and, it's good because people just want to be told yeah. what to do. The The thing that they have a hard time with, though, is they're like, oh, but he, Marcus told me I have to do, you know, sure. yeah. eight, whatever at reps and sets and I can't do anything else. But it's like, well, if you experimented, yeah. maybe you might realize that like doing the tempo stuff is actually going to feel better. Training is an evolution. It's like learn something that you can grab a hold of that gets you started mm. and then be open minded enough to just let more seep in over mm -hmm. time as you get better mm -hmm. don't try and learn 20 things at the beginning you know learn your one anchor point and then move forward yeah and on the topic of caloric you know output you know people do want to burn calories right in 45 minutes if i can burn 500 calories and feel good at the end versus 200 you know it's an energy balance equation that people are trying to optimize so they can look and feel the way they want to feel and I think as an as a high level athlete, yeah, the the answer is yeah. If you can go and hit eight sets of two with high weights, like the the impact that's going to have on your the tissue breakdown, your nervous system, plus the caloric output in the session, and then the caloric output in trying to recover from the session, like the grand total of that is probably going to be more than doing a you know a tempo you know workout. But people that are starting don't have access to that. Mm -hmm. They can't go do eight sets of you know, two at 500 pounds, you know, what can they do? And I do believe that doing these tempo resistance training supersets where you can pack a lot into a short amount of time and you can hold more tension, that is the way that people can connect weight training as a great way to burn calories. Because mm -hmm. right now it's burn calories means run on the treadmill, not go and do a weight training set. And I think it's, it, that, mm -hmm. that can introduce people to a concept that really gets them, oh yeah, like I can burn a lot of calories if I lift this way. 
Mm -hmm. And then just last question for me, because earlier about, uh, you know, e eating less and then moving less and then you get end up accruing more body fat and then versus eating more and then being able to move more and you're actually going to drop fat. Uh, just because I feel like somebody might misunderstand what you're saying when you're like, no, you need to eat more. What exactly do you mean? Like, what, what does eating more look like? You had even mentioned like 400 calories. Sure. But like, does that mean adding a, a bigger piece of steak? Does it mean adding another potato or does it mean adding another pair of pop tarts at the end of the night or whatever? I just want people to understand that yeah, you, that's yeah, yeah. not what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, we all have like a, a, a daily energy expenditure that we average over the course of different ports of our life. It can change, you know, when you're more active, less active, but I'm talking to the person who their daily activity combined with their metabolism burns 2,500 calories, let's say, as an example. They're, in, they're caught up in the culture of, I got to eat less than that. I always have to eat less. I'm going to eat 2,000 calories. I'm always going to be 500 under. You can't be 500 under perpetually forever. You will, your brain will start to do really crazy things. You will start to waste away. You will lose functional tissue. And your body will generally want to slow down. So all those things happen. And then because we, I can look over there and there's food right there. Like you're always surrounded by food. You will eventually fix that problem by reaching for food. Mm -hmm. You won't be in 500 calorie deficit forever because it's right there. And the marketing is right there. And the burger is right there. So you will overeat. So my point is, instead of trying to stay committed to that, I'm going to always be under eating. Try and just eat a little bit more to make that, to hit that maintenance level, right? And of course, that's going to be different for each person, but it does look like just add a little bit more food to your plate. You're going to have, you know, you're trying to eat healthy. So you're eating egg whites and spinach and four almonds, right? That's a healthy meal, mm -hmm. but it's low calorie focused. It's about restricting. So instead, why don't you add a whole egg to that? Have eight almonds, you know, pour some olive oil on your spinach. You just raise the caloric intake of that meal, not by some crazy substantial amount, but, and you stuck to good foods, but it's like, just start to reverse the thinking of less is more, less is more, less is more. Why isn't this working anymore? Why isn't this working? It's because you're always thinking less and you're binging and you're eating, you know, you're getting caught up in eating easy to access calories from every angle that is available in the world, which is many. All said. You got any other questions? I'm good. Yeah. All good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much for today. Uh, that was that was freaking awesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, Andrew, want to take us on out of here, buddy? Yeah, I will. Again, shout out to everybody in the uh, the live chat. You guys were awesome today. Thank you so much for being so active. And uh, shout out to uh, all all might. Uh, it was funny. I kept telling ah. them, I just kept telling them that the chat room is not ready to learn biomechanics through a chat room. Uh, mm -hmm. You know whatever section but uh thank you to element for sponsoring today's podcast uh drink com slash power project please follow the podcast at mark bell's power project on instagram at mb power project on tiktok and twitter my instagram and twitter is at i am andrew z at the andrew z on tiktok and sema where you at i'm gonna mention one thing real quick i heard you mention the chili pad we also work with a company called eight sleep mm -hmm. they have this mattress yeah. topper mm -hmm. that uh cools your bed down to 55 degrees and you can cool Man, what both a game sides. changer having the bed be a certain temperature oh right? my Amazing. gosh yeah that's the thing i miss the most when we're staying at a hotel <laughs> i like, i don't care how the bed could be uncomfortable but i'm like mm -hmm. it's just too hot mm -hmm. big difference big difference makes a massive difference so mm -hmm. if you guys are interested andrew Tell the people about Eight Sleep real eight quick. Sleep.com. That's E I G H T sleep.com slash power project. I can't spell, okay? Uh, head over there. You guys will receive uh, $150 off your uh, the mattress topper that they were just talking about or your mattress topper and mattress combo. Um, again, that's $150 off. Links to them down in the description below and see where you're at. And see my Yang on Instagram and YouTube. And see my Yin Yang on TikTok and Twitter. Marcus? At Marcus Philly on Instagram and on YouTube. Awesome. Thanks again for your time. Really appreciate it. Just want to end on this uh, last note here because uh, I just was looking up stuff on Charles Pollock when like more recently I was like, man, I, I miss that guy. I want to check out more information on him. So there didn't used to be much information on him online because he held a lot of stuff close to him. But since his passing, like there's a lot of like seminars and stuff online. So I was watching this one clip where somebody was interviewing him and uh, he was just like, he was really cold, like with his like answers. And he was, he was, uh, 
like a no bullshit kind of guy. And somebody asked him, um, they were asking him like how he gets his uh, athletes to eat correctly. Cause that's like one of the biggest problems sometimes with athletes. And he said, well, we just have a saying that a uh, third place tastes like cake. <laughs> And I just thought that was amazing because, yeah, that means that means that you're probably cheating on your diet. You're not really committed to the full plan. And I was just like, man, that's that's a good one. Yeah, I was like, fuck, man, that's really good. So, anyway, strength is never weakness. Weakness is never strength. Catch you guys later.